Good afternoon and happy January. I'm Patty Jimenez, teacher librarian at Sunny Slope High School and member of the AZLA Professional Development Committee. I will be your moderator for today's webinar. The AZLA Professional Development Committee provides enhanced professional development opportunities for members to increase the knowledge, skills, and abilities of library and information professionals across the state of Arizona. Before we get started, please note a few housekeeping details. Webinar participants are in listen-only mode. Please post your questions anytime during the presentation in the chat at the bottom of your screen. You can turn on live transcript and choose show subtitles in your Zoom window for closed captioning. This session is being recorded and the recording will be made available on the Arizona Library Association YouTube channel. A link will be provided in your follow-up email. Lauren Clementino will be your technical director today. If you have any technical issues during the webinar, you can contact her via the chat. If you are unable to hear sound during the webinar, you may dial in using the phone number provided in your registration confirmation email. At the end of the webinar, we ask that you complete a simple evaluation survey. The estimated time to complete the survey is two to three minutes. Please take the time to complete it as we use the data to improve our offerings to you and your feedback is important to us. I'd like to encourage library staff of all levels to consider becoming an Arizona Library Association member. Among other things, your membership enables AZLA to provide professional development opportunities to library staff across Arizona. Visit azla.org for additional information. Please support AZLA. When you add our organization as your designated charity, and purchased through the Amazon Smile portal, Amazon will donate 5% of your eligible purchases made to the Arizona Library Association. The Professional Development Committee is seeking proposals for our 2023 webinars. If you have expertise in library science that you think would help other libraries and librarians, please consider applying to be a webinar presenter. You will find a link in your webinar follow-up email. I want to invite you to the next program in our monthly webinar series brought to you by the AZLA Professional Development Committee. On February 9th, join us for Coloring Between the Walls, Using Art to Expand Patron Consciousness, Creating Connections and Provide Beauty with Karina Wilhelm, Ellen Meisinger, and Kelly Pacheco. Libraries are filled with physical materials, but what to do when the materials are worn out or if you have excess? How can we use them to build relationships in the community? Karina Wilhelm, manager of the ASU Design and the Arts Library, and Elaine, I'm sorry, Ellen Meisinger, ASU art professor, have collaborated on nine annual student art exhibits at the library. With an emphasis on sustainability, students in Messinger's Art on Paper class are given maps withdrawn from the library and then assigned to repurpose the maps using an exhibit theme chosen by the class. The Creative Cartography Partnership incorporates visits to the ASU Library's map and geospatial hub and makerspace and culminates in an annual exhibit in the library. This partnership provides exhibition opportunities for, for students from diverse backgrounds introduces library patrons to new artists, and makes connections between the library and the ASU community. Kelly Pacheco, a student in the 2022 Art on Paper class, will join to reflect on her experience using library resources to create art. Registration for this webinar is posted to the AZLA calendar, advertised in the monthly professional development email blast, and a link will be provided in your webinar follow-up email. I would like to thank all of you for attending today. Your presence makes these webinars possible. And I'd like to now welcome our presenter today, Berlin Loa, 
for her presentation, Knowledge River Scholars, Growth and Impact in Arizona. Hi, thanks so much. Okay, let me share my screen here. Patricia, how does that look? Perfect. Okay, great. So I'm here today to uh, talk with you about Knowledge River, and I'm just going to go ahead and skip forward what you're seeing here are images of some of our past cohorts. I love to share these photographs because it just shows sort of the progression of how we've worked with each other over time, and you can see so many of the different cohorts coming together at different times and some uh, colleagues of our, ours who were highlighted at uh, AZLA in fall 2019 when that was held here in Tucson. My name is Berlin Loa, as uh, our AZLA host mentioned. I am an assistant professor at the University of Arizona School of Information and uh, manage the Knowledge River program, which I'll talk to you about today. I have a background uh, working in archives and museums, and I currently teach courses in archival theory and practice and in collections management. Centered in my work here as a scholar and as an archivist is place, culture, and identity as they relate to cultural heritage preservation in libraries, archives, and museums. And I'm really interested in the reciprocal relationship between creators, uh, preservation work, and society. So uh, today I'm going to be talking with you about the Knowledge River program, beginning with a brief history of the program within the greater context of the DEI efforts in the library field and events affecting the communities of people of color who have largely been historically marginalized. And then we'll look at the goals for KR and the, and the growth of KR, as, long, uh, as well as some opportunities. Uh, so just a, a quick detail before we get started. Today I'll be using the term BIPOC for uh, to represent people of color as a collective term uh, to re to represent historically marginalized or underserved communities. Um, I use the term BIPOC to give weight to our community members who have jointly worked for human rights, information access rights, labor rights, and civil rights throughout our history um, as people of color. I recognize the challenge of using the term BIPOC. This is an acronym that was chosen to counter historically imposed racial labels. So it includes Black, Indigenous, and other folks who identify as people of color. Uh, these individualized imposed racial labels can often exclude those who don't identify in a single category. And so collectively, we use the term BIPOC. KR continues to expand this conversation on ethnic identity, ways of knowledge, ways of organizing and preserving information, and ways to uh, work with and support marginalized people through a dynamic community of researchers, teachers, um, students, and practitioners. So while the term BIPOC has its own uh, problems and sometimes the unique experiences of Black and Indigenous communities can be lost when we talk about people collectively, uh, currently, this is a term that clearly differentiates the collective experience of folks who have been historically marginalized, largely due uh, to the color of their skin and their ethnic culture. So for today, we'll be using the term BIPOC. So what you see on the screen is um, some early uh, Knowledge River scholars uh, who are recruited and, um, and come into the program. The program is designed specifically for BIPOC scholars. No one is excluded. Anyone is included in the program, but it really is designed for folks coming from various Latino backgrounds, Indigenous, uh, Native American, and Black communities. And we center the BIPOC experience in library science, uh, bringing their cultural knowledge and technical knowledge and academic knowledge to the field in order to enact change in a way that really benefits uh, our users and our coworkers broadly. We take an approach of critical cultural approaches to information science 
and information environments broadly, including libraries, archives, and museums, because a lot of our work crosses over. I use the um, the acronym LAMS, L-A-M-S, frequently, so that is libraries, archives, and museums collectively. We uh, recognize that there are intersecting ethnic identities and cultural identities, and that we have shared cultural experiences as BIPOC folks. We bring that knowledge with us to the library um, and to library science through the Knowledge River program to serve communities of color and to serve the broader public in understanding what some of those issues are. The program prepares scholars for graduate school uh, with a opening seminar prior to the uh, semester starting in the fall and with graduate school opportunities and postgrad opportunities by connecting them with current scholars in the field and with alumni from the Knowledge River program. We provide funding for scholars via scholarships or via GA, which are graduate assistant positions with some of our community partners. And I'll go ahead and talk about those in just a few minutes. So I wanna talk a little bit about how we got here uh, to help understand the background of what it means to have the Knowledge River program here at the University of Arizona, and also what it means to our partners and to the broader community. Uh, Knowledge River is now in its 20th year as a program, but prior to that, there was another program here at the University of Arizona called GLISA, the Graduate Library Institute for the Spanish Speaking, which ran roughly 1976 to 1980. It was in development before 76, but 76 was the first uh, uh, graduating class. So uh, Dr. Trejo was the founder of this program. He had worked at UCLA, he had worked internationally in Mexico, Peru, and Venezuela, uh, and then began his term at the University of Arizona in 1968. During this time, he recognized a need to serve Spanish-speaking populations here in Arizona, um, given that there was such a large uh, Spanish-speaking population, given our proximity to the border and the historic um, nation-state status of Arizona uh, as previously being part of Mexico, a lot of uh, the culture crossed over. And around the same time, there was a report of librarianship coming out of California in which uh, it was recognized that out of over 7,000 people who received their master's degrees in library science between 1973 and 1974, only 99 of those had a Spanish identified surname, uh, which meant that there was a very small portion of librarians coming out of graduate school at the time who were prepared to work with Spanish-speaking populations or people coming from different uh, Latino populations. So that's just a little bit over 1% of the de degree librarians at that time with Spanish surnames. Uh, this didn't even take into account intersectional uh, culture or ethnicity, which of course we now know as a significant impact on library services for marginalized people. But for that time, we can accept that surnames were uh, uh, an acceptable measure of representation with the info uh, information that they had available. So GLISA was designed to develop professional competencies in library services with an emphasis on Spanish speaking librarians who would then be prepared to work in communities with large Spanish speaking populations. Uh, again, the program began in the mid 70s and ran through 1980. Our friend uh, Bob Diaz, who works here at University of Arizona Special Collections, just did a great presentation, uh, a more extensive uh, presentation on Dr. Trejo. Uh, so if you have an opportunity to see that, uh, take, a look, take a look at that presentation. Uh, so in 1974, the same year that Trejo and the GLISA committee read the report about those 99 Spanish speaking uh, Spanish surnames. They also found that in California with the Spanish origin population of over two and a half million people, um, there were only 50 Spanish speaking librarians there at the time. And the numbers were just as dismal for other states like Texas, New Mexico, Colorado, Utah, and Arizona. All of these states 
had large uh, Spanish language populations, mostly Mexican American, but also South and Central American. And at the time, Trejo was not looking specifically at native or indigenous populations, but suffice to say that the native populations and those that identified as both indigenous and Latino were not represented uh, in the library field at the time. And even today, the number of uh, native degree librarians continues to hover around 2% um, for native and indigenous librarians who are decreed. So I am currently conducting further research into the Galisa program to develop a stronger picture of the efforts and the outcomes. But again, Bob Diaz did a great presentation recently, and I'm sure he'd be happy to share that information with you. Uh, between 1980, when the last Galisa cohort graduated, and 2001, there's not a strong record of explicit diversity initiatives programs uh, within the library school, uh, but I'm still looking to see what that path was. And of course, we'll update my reports and, and uh, my re uh, presentations as my research progresses. Meanwhile, though, faculty around the University of Arizona campus and on campuses nationwide were aware of the, the needs of uh, marginalized communities, Latino, Native, Black communities, and pursued efforts to increase awareness and services, right? So this is a time when ethnic studies programs were growing on campuses, programs such as the American Indian Studies programs, Mexican American Studies, African American Studies, uh, of which I'm an, an alum. And here at the UA, these were beginning during this era and, era and growing during this era. And similar programs were developed across the nation in the wake of the civil rights movement and various efforts of uh, Chicano organizations, Black and other marginalized people. And in 2001, members of the School of Information faculty here at the university founded Knowledge River as a program to address Hispanic and Native American library and information science issues. And the recruitment of students, um, of these students for careers as librarians and in information science. The first cohort graduated in 2002, and the most recent cohort, of course, graduated in uh, spring of last year. Uh, so here's a brief history of Knowledge River in the early cohorts. In, uh, in the early days, the first uh, couple of years, the program was founded by faculty members, including Pat Tharin, Carla Stoffel, who you uh, may have known as the, as the Dean of the University of Arizona Library, Richard Chavran, who has a long career in librarianship and uh, advocating for bridging the digital divide. Uh, and there's a committee that launches the Knowledge River program. The first uh, few years were funded by a grant by IMLS, the Institute for Museum and Library Sci uh, um, Services. And in 2003, our first cohort graduated. Shifts in the program take place over time. Initially, the program was focused specifically on indigenous and Latino populations, and Latino was, uh, uh, I'm sorry, excuse me, Hispanic populations, and Hispanic populations were meant to include anyone from Hispanic and Latino identifying backgrounds. And with each program manager that comes in, the program shifts a little bit with our interests, which kind of keeps it fresh and keeps it interesting, but always we return to the goal and the mission to increase representation of BIPOC scholars, librarians, and information science folks in the field in order to better serve our communities. In 2009, uh, Sandy Littletree, uh, Dr. Sandy Littletree, who's now at the University of Washington, was managing the program and lots of things were happening. There's a greater awareness of indigenous librarianship growing around the nation. And around the same time, ATOLM, the Association for Tribal Archives, Libraries and Museums was forming as a national organization with one of their early meetings, perhaps even their first meeting taking place here. Uh, so Dr. Littletree and several uh, Knowledge River students were part of that development. And of course, many of us have attended the first joint conference between AASLH, the uh, American Association for State and Local History, and ATOLM, the Association of Tribal Archives, Libraries, and Museums. So we can see where some of these, some of our work in LAMS begins to merge 
All right, so we start to move away from these isolated silos of libraries, archives, and museums. And while we still have unique aspects to our work and unique approaches um, in practice and theory, there's a lot of overlap there when we start thinking about and implementing uh, the knowledge ways of indigenous communities, black communities, and uh, the, the various Latino communities in the ways that we approach knowledge organization access to information and what we consider to be archive and cultural archives and cultural heritage. So at that time, the care program also launched we search W E search, which stood for wellness education in conjunction with the Arizona health science libraries in which KR students uh, were working with a group of local high school students in order to educate them about consumer health education and research and all of these program efforts focused on community impact within our respective indigenous and Latino communities. So here i'm just sharing an example of some of our early scholars Annabel Nunez, which some of you may know, who is the, now the associate director of UA health sciences library. Erica Castaño, who, of course, works here at University of Arizona special collections and Joseph uh, Valdez who works with the state of New Mexico. His office is in the New Mexico Department of Transportation, but he works with other um, offices throughout the state in terms of uh, information access and um, uh, information science. So you can see that our scholars sort of go into a, a, a wide range of work, not uh, quote unquote, just libraries. And that is not to, um, uh, to minimize the impact of libraries, but just that we, we do a broad range of scholarly work and uh, practical work. So I joined the faculty of the iSchool uh, in summer of 2019. And the program uh, has always had a range of ethnic re representation. You can see uh, that you'll be able to see that in our numbers in just a few minutes here, but it's important to adjust our outreach to explicitly state the invitation to BIPOC folks beyond Latino and Native American, because um, what is not said and what is said matters so much. And it's often silent exclusions that negatively affect BIPOC communities. So we're not explicitly inviting BIPOC folks of different identities into our work. That is a silent exclusion. And again, as I said, with each program manager, the KR program grows and shifts to meet the needs of our communities of color and addressing contemporary issues while working with resources available to us through the university, through the iSchool, through our partners and, and through our grant funding. So when I came on board in summer of 2019, uh, it was really important to me to look at where the program had been and then to begin to grow the program in such a way as to be uh, inclusive of uh, folks in the way that they're identifying today. And so we explicitly began stating that we were being inclusive of, inclusive of BIPOC folks. That includes the various identities of Latino and Latinidad, which comes out of all sorts of different um, nation states, different language groups, different cultural groups, and different ethnic groups. It is not a monolith, and so it was important to begin to talk about that uh, in how we look at different groupings of uh, ethnic and cultural identity. And to include the identity of Black explicitly, because there are folks who uh, identify as Black or as Afro-Latino or in other ways who may not have been in, uh, felt included by the term Latino or by the term indigenous, which um, it siloed in that way may not necessarily be inclusive of folks who identify as black or as Afro Latino or in other ways. So we changed our wording a little bit to, um, to start to begin to use the term uh, BIPOC. Here are a couple of other of our uh, graduates. Kim Arthur, KR8, which would have been um, circa 2006, 2007. She's now a museum technician up at Denali National Park and Preserve in Alaska. Chris Curley, who uh, has been working in San Diego County Libraries for, um, I believe, over a decade now, or almost a decade now, 
um, and has grown in his position. I believe his current title is branch manager, but uh, he's a mover and shaker. So uh, Chris, if you're out there and this is no longer your title, let me know. And then uh, Ray Baca, who is one of our more recent graduates, has been working at Pima County Public Library for quite a while and recently took on the role as social media librarian. As of spring 2022, we now have over 250 Knowledge River scholars who have earned a master's degree in library and information science. Approximately a quarter of those are Native American, uh, approximately two thirds identify as Latino, and the remainder rep um, uh, represent other uh, self, -identity, uh, self identified ethnic identities or unknown if they didn't self-identity uh, self-identify so uh here you can see a couple of other uh historical points of interest on the knowledge river program in 2020 of course we moved the program online you can see our little zoom screen there in 2018 the university of arizona was designated as an hispanic serving institution and the knowledge river program uh, became very closely affiliated with our uh, hispanic serving institution office and again, in 2019, I came on board and uh, brought my experience in museums and archives with me and moved to expand the focus on BIPOC and intersectional identities. And uh, one of the things that I was really fortunate to come into in the program that has been established for so long is that the previous program managers did such an excellent job of developing community partnerships strengthening community partnerships and working uh, to build these ways in which our Knowledge River scholars could become engaged in work in libraries, archives, and museums while they're still graduate students. So I was very fortunate to walk into a, a strong program and then to continue to build on that and add new positions and new partnerships, which is the work that I do now. Again, 2020, uh, the onset of the pandemic here in the U.S. affected our face-to-face -face program. Uh, most of the time, Knowledge River meets for an orientation seminar prior to the semester starting. We almost always met in person. It was a great way to build community, build the cohort strength, and then work together to enter the semester. We moved online. Uh, we're working on serving our recent graduates to learn more about their experience. This is, however, a universal experience, right? Students across the board, not only in Knowledge River and not only in the iSchool, but throughout universities uh, here in the US, of course, were affected by this. In 2020, we also uh, were able to um, secure funding by IMLS to address our main objectives which were to, one, of course, continue to fund folks coming into library science, but also to learn more about the experience of our folks in our first uh, 18 cohorts. So the survey that we're working on uh, runs from 2001 to 2020 graduates. And then uh, our students are surveyed as they exit the program periodically to learn more about their experience so that we continue to feed that information back into our program and then into the uh, next cohorts that come on board. And last year, 2022, KR was recognized for uh, uh, an example of Excelencia in Education, which is a national program that identifies uh, programs, educational programs throughout the, throughout the United States that are focused on Hispanic and Latino populations. So uh, myself and one of our graduate students who you see in the top right-hand corner here, Victoria, who is my graduate assistant, were able to travel to DC, meet a, a lot of other Excellencia in Education nominees, and get to learn more about how we can enact the work of Excellencia in Education. A few more of our um, scholars here. We have Mario Villa, who is now a PhD scholar in Indigenous Information Science at Syracuse University. Bianca, excuse me, Bianca Alper, who is now the Digital Project Archivist at the University of Arizona Special Collections. Uh, we're celebrating that new position for her. And Rashida Scott, who is a newly appointed business and communications librarian at San Diego State 
University. We love celebrating uh, our scholars. Okay, so a few numbers here, and I don't want to drown you in numbers, but I think it's really important to talk about this. So we're not going to do all on this slide too long, but I did want to build in some of this background to give you an idea of what the field, what KR looks like and what the, compared to what the numbers in the field looks like. Uh, so there is an incremental shift taking place over time in the LIS field. Uh, this, these are the numbers of KR uh, 20, 2001 to 2018. So that's cohort one through uh, cohort 19. You can see the ethnic racial breakdown. These are self-identified um, uh, racial and cultural identities. So uh, whole numbers, we have seven Anglo-European quote, you know, uh, AKA white folks in the program. 157 graduates identified as Latino Hispanic. That's about 64%, so a little over half. Uh, 60 or 20, 60 folks or 24% Native American. Uh, three black students we've had more since then. One who identified as East Asian and 20 who did not self-identify. And you can see in terms of gender, up until 2018, we were asking folks to identify between the binary female and male. So that's what these numbers represent. Uh, we now ask them to self-identify in other ways. Uh, and you can see the majority of our uh, enrollment has been female, which closely matches what happens in the LIS field. In terms of education, 15 of our scholars have gone in, including Mario, who I just showed on the screen, have gone on to doctoral programs, which is excellent because folks going into doctoral programs then leads to more research, more writing, more academic output, and more teaching and growing um, the knowledge base of folks of color and marginalized communities in the field to help us grow uh, our knowledge broadly as a field in this, in this area. Four have uh, gone on to additional MA programs after their MA in Library and Information Science. What this doesn't show you is the number of folks who come in already having had an MA in things like anthropology, uh, ethnic studies, Mexican American studies, uh, Spanish, French, uh, biology, all sorts of fields that people have degrees in before they come into library science. But you likely know that from your own colleagues, your own coworkers. Uh, and then we have a 95% graduation rate, which is in the Knowledge River program, which is of course a great number. Uh, and part of that is in the way that we approach scholars, which I'll talk about in just a few minutes here. So what we're still working on is um, data about where our folks are working. I've shared nine examples of where folks work, but our survey will help answer where folks are now. Uh, we're really looking into current titles and classifications to figure out where folks land after coming out of a program like Knowledge River, and then asking uh, qualitative questions about the impact that they have had on services and in their communities. Okay, so uh, this is just sort of a snapshot of those same numbers. And the reason I wanted to provide this for 2020 to 2023 in comparison to the previous years is because we've changed the way that we ask the question, again, with attention to intersectionality and the different ways in which folks identify. So you'll see something on the screen like Latino, 16 folks, 49%. And then if you can see the colors in orange, it'll say Latino plus, and that's one person who identifies as Latino plus other. So that might be Afro-Latino, it might be indigenous Latino, it might be Latino plus another ethnic identity. Uh, and then you can see in the sort of light blue, uh, Native American, three individuals or 9%. And next to that, it says Native plus. And that is somebody who is of myth mixed uh, racial or ethnic culture, so it might be Native and white, Native and Latino. And the reason we're asking the questions in this way now is because, of course, with current uh, research and uh, identity 
practices, we recognize that folks don't fit so neatly siloed into one or the other. And this is almost especially true with the terms Latino and Hispanic, which can be, be confusing and can be confused and uh, tend to put folks in a, um, sort of this um, under this umbrella. And there's all sorts of things that, uh, you know, different ways to identify that fit under that umbrella, right? Latino covers everything from, you know, uh, Cuba to, um, to, to Mexico, which are largely different cultural, um, cultural ways of being cultural knowledge, although they do share a Spanish language. So anyway, that's just a snapshot to, to share what the numbers look like in more recent years. Okay. So let's take a look at how this compares to what's happening in the LIS field, and then I'll wrap up. So we just have a couple more slides to go here. These are historic numbers in DEI initiatives uh, in LIS. So recognizing where folks of color, where BIPOC folks are coming from. And I have the numbers from ALA Research and Statistics for 2014 and 2017 listed here. I did not have access to more recent numbers out of AL the ALA office. So what I've shared here in comparison is DPE, the National Department for Professional Employees coming out of uh, AFL-CIO. Uh, and so they're not the exact same questions, but it's comparable data. So as you can see, the numbers are shifting incrementally. <laughs> the problem of cultural invisibility or lack of diversity in libraries uh, and archives and museums is a long-standing one. You know, back to the 60s, which you know I mentioned before, um, when the momentum in civil rights really grew and impacted the way that we approach these things. And back in the 60s, uh, ALA established an ad hoc committee on opportunities for Black students in the library profession. For that particular report, Latinos, Native Americans, Asians, and others were not um, on that particular ALA research radar, but that's okay. Uh, what they found was that, uh, or what they did was that library schools were asked to uh, report on how many students uh, who were coming out of their graduate schools identified as black, and it was somewhere around 5%. So you can see we went from 5% at that point, if we're just looking at black or African-American identified folks to uh, uh, 4.3 percent identifying in that way in 2014, and then to uh, approximately 4 percent in 2017. And then if we go to 2019 at the DPE numbers, that looks like 5 percent. And again, the questions asked by ALA Research and Statistics and the questions asked by DPE were a little bit different in terms of identity and titles in libraries, but you can see that they're comparable numbers. So the incremental growth has truly been incremental. We go from 87% who identify as white non-Hispanic in 2014 to 83% um, in 2019. What to take from here though, is that with over 87% of, of degreed librarians identifying as white and the remainder identifying as a mix of these other cultures, this is not to say that we have to replace one with the other or there has to be an exact ratio of population to representation, but that there is room for growth, that there is room for more um, mix of diversity in terms of ethnic identity in librarianship. There's room uh, to engage more of our communities here than we have been historically. Okay, so we're wrapping up here and I just wanted to uh, share with you, as I said before, some of the things that we've identified as ways to uh, help students be successful is to partner with folks in the in our local communities to help place students in job learning environments while they're in graduate school. So some of our graduate assistants work in places like special collections in the archives at the University of Arizona libraries. Arizona Health Science Library was one of our past partners. Uh, Pima County Public Library is an ongoing partner. So uh, 
Arizona State University up in Tempe. Some of our students are placed there and work in archives and in the academic library. And of course, University of Arizona Libraries is one of our partners and we are funded by IMLS Institute of Museum and Library Services. What I should say also is that many of our partners also not only partner in helping place these students, but partner through funding some of these positions. So we really work in conjunction with the students in a learning environment, being supervised by degreed librarians and learning on the job. So they're contributing to real projects that help move these organizations forward with their goals while the students learn from their cohort uh, and their learning environment. So as an example of some of the things that they do, we have uh, KRs working with Latino communities and Spanish speaking communities. This uh, image that you see here is from a, a meeting of Nuestras Raices and um, which is a group that comes out of the Pima County Public Library. So if you're in the audience and you see yourself in the photo, say hello in the chat. Uh, we also have folks working with Reforma Tucson chapter. Of course, as many of you know, Reforma is a national association for library services to the Spanish speaking. We have a Tucson chapter and uh, some of our alum, Cheryl Gerken, who now works at University of Arizona Libraries and Bianca Elper, who I mentioned before. Uh, are both members and strong contributors to, to that local chapter. Uh, they helped put together uh, an event called Dia del Nino at Galleria Mitotera, which you see on the screen there. So we have a longstanding relationship with Reforma through Dr. Trejo, but also through the Knowledge River program for the last 20 years. And you can see some other examples here of what, what folks are doing. Uh, one of the uh, great things that have, has come out of this partnership is learning about the different ways in which information science works specifically in our region, the Southwest and in the borderlands. So one of our scholars, uh, Abraham, who you see, uh, whose name you see here on the screen, is working in a borderlands fellowship, and that's helping to develop and work with information that is available to folks in the borderlands who are, uh, it's an education focused program. So I won't go too far into it because we've just got a few minutes left here. Um, okay, so uh, Knowledge Rivers, Knowledge River Scholars and Indigenous Communities, again, the GAs work at ASU with Labriola National American Indian Data Center, which of course is a special library at ASU that focuses on, on, focuses on Indigenous um, collections, information, and programs led by uh, Alex Soto, who is the director up there. Uh, and then, of course, we center BIPOC and advance equity and inclusion in terms of uh, indigenous needs in information science and information access and the organization of information. So we work with the Mennon Nations group doing outreach to indigenous communities, again, through Pima County Public Library. And then um, we've done presentations with ALA, AZLA, and ATOLM. And we're currently working to develop partnerships with the Tana Otam Nation, Pascoyaki, and Gila River communities to uh, to help uh, place Indigenous students, but also to give them opportunities for working in Indigenous knowledge uh, environments in order to bring those skills back to, um, back to their own communities. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, knowledge River Scholars working in Black communities. Again, uh, Pima County Public Library Affinity Group is called Kindred, and they work specifically on collections and programs designed for members of the Black community in Pima County and uh, more broadly in the Southwest of Arizona. Uh, Rashida Scott, who was pictured in an earlier slide, uh, wrote this excellent uh, post on uh, reflection on bell hooks through ASU's Black collection and of course, ASU has now developed a Black Archives collection, which is an amazing collection led by um, uh, Jessica up there, who is the archivist for the Black collection. Uh, let's see, two of our scholars went to the uh, Bacala Leadership Institute. That's the Black Caucus of the American Library Association. Uh, they came back with an excellent experience and has have brought that knowledge back to us at Knowledge River. Uh, and in fact, we had a guest speaker 
uh, that Brian Armstrong brought with us, brought with him to us <laughs> at the Knowledge River program just last night for our Knowledge River scholars. Uh, I'm working closely with the Dunbar Pavilion, which is an historical site here um, in uh, in Tucson, and with the Southern Arizona African American Museum to develop some opportunities for our students to work with the collections and begin to um, to work with these communities. Right. So, uh, as I wrap up here in my last few minutes. Uh, I strongly believe that together we can enact impact in DEI and LIS is really the goal of the Knowledge River program. It's a goal that we should, could and should be working on collectively. And I just want to do a shout out to all these other programs who are doing similar work. Uh, research has shown broadly that education inequality largely stems from gaps in socioeconomic backgrounds. And the determinants of socioeconomic status are wealth and race. And unfortunately, uh, it makes it one of the biggest factors of education. Having access to education has a huge impact on what folks are able to do, the fields that they're able to enter into, and the impact they're able to have in their own communities. So it's really important to me to uh, give a shout out to these other programs like Knowledge River. Uh, ALA Spectrum Program, I believe that application just opened up. ARL, Association of Research um, Libraries Kaleidoscope Scholarship Program, the Airy Emerging Scholars Program, We Here, Museum Pew, uh, the Minnesota Institute for Early Career Librarians, there's a fellowship program at NCSU, uh, there's a newly funded Bridging Knowledge Program at San Jose State, State University, uh, and a few others, right? There's many others that are doing this work. So while I'm here to really talk to you about Knowledge River, I can't help but say, uh, or just shout out to these other programs who are doing similar work. And I hope that you and your libraries find a way to connect with one of us, with Knowledge River, or one of these other programs to help enhance your library and your library services to provide opportunities for up and coming Knowledge River, um, excuse me, uh, not up and coming uh, scholars, including Knowledge River, of course, uh, but to provide opportunity for these up and coming scholars to be part of your organization through scholarship partnerships, uh, graduate assistant partnerships, internship partnerships, program partnerships, working with your collections, working with your community, developing programs, etc. cetera. Uh, lastly, I'll share this uh, lovely slide of uh, collective um, uh, events that we've had over the last couple of years. Uh, that's KR Cohorts at AZLA in uh, 2019. That was really fun. That was here at the Tucson uh, Convention Center. And you can see cohorts three through 18 who gathered for this photo. Um, so we're always connected as KR scholars. We frequently run into each other, of course, in this field, but it's always nice to connect again uh, live and in person. And then, of course, just a few months after that, COVID hits. So we hadn't seen each other for a while, uh, but we had our first gathering again in fall, December of 2021, hosted by one of our scholars. So you can see we're outside, we're in an open air space, being very careful. And then in, um, gosh, I guess this was summer 2022, we moved back inside into this really large uh, uh, indoor space, but we moved back inside because, you know, August in Tucson, you, you've got to be inside. Okay, so lastly, I just want to share that we are currently recruiting for the next Knowledge River uh, cohort, which will begin in fall of 2023. That application opens February 1st, and the applications are due March 13th. So folks who are interested in earning a degree in library science and being part of the Knowledge River program should apply to the iSchool. I believe there are links in the chat should apply to the iSchool, their deadlines for being accepted to the graduate school and apply to the Knowledge River program separately. And the links in the chat also include a way to attend information sessions specifically about um, applying to the Knowledge River program. And you can see our uh, spring 2022 graduates here on the screen. So thank you for your time. I will stop my share and open up to uh, questions. All right. Thank you so much, Berlin, for all that great information. Uh, we do have a couple of questions to get us started. And of course, uh, everyone 
uh, listening. If you have a question, please put it in the chat and I will get to as many of them as I can in the next few moments. Um, start us off with, um, you shared data about um, the students in your program, but do you have any data on, uh, you know, post-graduation, the employment of graduates? Um, do you know sort of in general where they're going? Uh, how many actually did end up in libraries? And, and really how many are employed in Arizona? Any of the, that kind of information? That's a great question. And we actually do. We have, uh, I don't have it in front of me, so I can't give you a number off the top of my head, but we do collect that data in terms of folks being employed out of grad school. And then uh, we really do our best to track folks over time and update where uh, they're currently working throughout their career. And again, the survey that's going out will collect more of that data. So we have we do have data. I cannot give it to you off the top of my head, but if you contact me, Berlin at Arizona, I'm more than happy to share that. And then we survey regularly so we can sort of update that information as we go. In terms of those who are uh, employed specifically in Arizona, I don't have a number for that. I mean, we could we could glean that from the data that I do have. Uh, but we really, you know, as you could see from the nine examples that I shared, folks, <laughs> folks go everywhere. So um, uh, I don't know that I have a number specifically of how many are currently working in Arizona, but I'm sure I could get that for you. Okay, excellent. It'd be interesting to see how many stay in the communities and, and help, um, you know, that next generation. And that kind of le leads me to my next question. Um, <laughs> how do I want to say this? Um, what can, what can those of us in, cause I think, you know, you're, you're recruiting, um, students who are in college cause you're a master's program. So they've gotten that far. Uh, what can we do sort of at those earlier levels, the teacher librarians, the teen librarians and public libraries, what can we be doing to encourage our BIPOC students to think about, um, this possibility of, of entering a program like Knowledge River and becoming librarians themselves? That's a great question. I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> so uh, one of the things that we've discovered in our 20 years of this program and in uh, talking with folks from those other programs that I mentioned is that one of the, the strongest impacts that we can have in early uh, scholars to help them grow through higher education is mentorship. Having somebody stand with them side by side to guide them through the program. Uh, because we've all, I think most of us have heard about quote unquote hidden curriculum, which are sort of the tips and tricks to get yourself into higher ed, to get through higher ed, to succeed in higher ed and to graduate from higher ed. So having a mentor and this this can mean a lot of different things. This can mean that if you are a degreed librarian and you recognize the folks in your library who have the potential or could have the potential if they know about it, uh, to work with them, to have those conversations with them, have a little info session or invite them to your desk or invite them to your projects or invite them to your committee. If you work in a library and you have a DEI committee or a collections management committee or a program committee, there's no reason that you couldn't invite one of these younger folks in as a committee member. One, it's gonna benefit you to get the youth voice into your development, but it's also gonna give them the benefit of hearing the real conversations that information scientists have. So that's an informal form of members of uh, mentorship that gives them insight into the field without you specifically saying, now do this, now do this. However, you could also do that, which is like, hey, did you ever think about librarianship? Here's a way to do it. Uh, so reach out to those folks around you. The other thing is to go to, um, to schools and tell folks about this, get involved in career days. As an example, uh, Cheryl Gherkin, she's in the chat right now, um, but Cheryl Gherkin and Jesus uh, Castaneda and I went to uh, a, a, a middle school 
for their career day. And we did a presentation. Cheryl, as an academic librarian, Jesus as a public librarian, and myself as an archivist, went and did a full day of rotating class. I don't remember, Cheryl, if you remember how many classes that was. But it was a full day of rotating classes talking to these middle schoolers about the potential of being a librarian. Um, and then the other thing is helping folks who are in undergraduate or looking at undergraduate to look at funding, what funding sources are available to them, because one of the greatest crimes is uh, having folks come out of school with um, with debt, which we know factually, <laughs> we know this, that it impacts marginalized folks of color more than anybody else and increases poverty while people are uh, growing through higher higher um, higher ed, they're increasing their skill set and they're decreasing their uh, their family wealth because of this increased debt. So you want to help them find funding. Can your organization maybe develop a scholarship for your employees to pay for one class a semester or two classes a semester? Is could that be a benefit that your library could develop for your employees? Uh, and then uh, the the other thing is to uh, provide a way for these students to learn with you. So treating them as potential professionals when they're working side by side with you. I hope that answered the question, but. <laughs> no, absolutely. Um, and I think you, you touched on this a little bit in that previous answer, but what do you see um, as the, the diversity, equity, and inclusion needs for the library field? Right, so I talked a little bit about the statistics of what the library field looks like now. Uh, and again, I, I really want to emphasize that when we say that it's 87 to, to 90% white identified folks and the rest are identified as other, we're not saying that we have to minimize the number of white folks in the field, but rather that there's room for more that there's room for growth. We all know if we work in, in LAMS, libraries, archives, and museums, we know that this is not a shrinking field. Our budgets may be shrinking, but we know that the need is ever growing because it's a constantly growing world of information, materials, digital materials, physical materials, uh, information just continues to grow, right? So there's plenty of room for growth and including folks from all sorts of identities. Uh, so some of the challenges are that the folks who are currently in the field may not be aware of this need. The more we educate ourselves, the more we educate our colleagues, the more we educate up and coming um, uh, new professionals, the more we begin to see that shift in understanding the need. So uh, I'm going to use the term ignorance here, and that's not meant to be an insult. I'm talking about the, the core under uh, the core lack of understanding as ignorance. So there is an ignorance for some folks of the challenges and the needs for communities who have been historically marginalized to have access to information that meets their community need. And then in other spaces, there is not only this type of ignorance, but there is also a reluctance to meet that need. But again, the more we have these conversations openly, the more we share the knowledge that we have, and the more that we're willing to um, engage with each other about these conversations openly, the more we can meet the needs of our community. So really getting to know our communities is core to that. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, do you have any uh, last thoughts in our final minute? that you'd like to touch on or, or discuss uh, about your program or about what you see as the future of uh, LIS? That's a big ask, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am always advocating for my program. So I just want to encourage you um, that if you are able to uh, support our Knowledge River scholars, you know, we, we always welcome new partnerships new programs. Of course, donations to our scholarship program are always welcome. You can find that in the iSchool link that was shared earlier and above. Uh, I invite you all to come to the information session about the application process. And of course, please share those links widely. We want uh, up and coming scholars to know about us. And if you have classes 
uh, at your universities or you have uh, groups that you'd like Knowledge River Scholars, myself, or some of our graduate students to come talk to about this being a, a potential career path, let me know and I'd be more than happy to organize that. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Berlin. Um, and I want to thank all of you for being with us today. You will all receive an email with the link to the recording of this webinar. I hope you have a wonderful day.